So we are continuing this series again that we started a few weeks ago as we have worked our way through the Gospel of Mark that has been leading us up to uh, the conclusion of the Gospel, which is Holy Week. Uh, and, and again, today we are celebrating Palm Sunday and, and the, the triumphal entry, and we're going to be looking at that text here this morning. But as we've been following and working our way through the Gospel of Mark and seeing all of these stories and these miracles and these healings and these teachings and and interactions that Jesus had with crowds and with Pharisees and, and with all kinds of different people. And we realized, again, that, that a God, the Gospels in our Bible, we have four of them in our Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and all four of these Gospels are focused on the story of Jesus in his life and what he accomplished in his time here on earth. And now all four of these writers, again, brings us a different perspective. They they have to get similar stories, and yet they bring a different flavor to how they explain and, and the interactions and teachings of Jesus. As we see, Mark, again, gives us a, a unique view, right, of, of this, the life of Jesus. And, and, we, and he wrote, again, from, from a perspective not coming from a firsthand experience with Jesus. Because two of the gospel writers, they were apostles or disciples that were with Jesus his entire time. Okay, two of them were not. Mark was one of them that is not a disciple. Okay, but yet Mark was a close associate of Peter. Okay, and during his, his ministry, you know, um, in the early church with Peter, Mark worked with Peter very closely. And Mark heard these stories and these teachings and, and everything that Peter described, and he wrote them down then for us to, to, to learn from and to, and to, to learn and to grow through. Again, the original um, context of the gospel was written for a Gentile audience. And so Mark does explain the Jewish customs and, and holidays and those things a little deeper than some of the other gospel writers do. And, and he was written, again, for a Gentile audience in Rome. Okay? And, and in this context of Rome, okay, and in this, this situation, they were under the authoritative rule of King Nero. Okay, and King Nero believed himself to be a god, and he, he asked, um, you know, all of, of everybody in his area and territory, right, to worship him as a god. Okay, which means that if, if by declaring that Jesus is the Messiah, by, by giving, giving him the lordship in your life, that you are declaring, right, that, that he is God. And which means by, by declaring that Jesus is God and the Messiah, that means that Nero's not. And so they invited lots of persecution into their life by, by drawing the line in the sand and making the public declaration that Jesus was the Messiah. And yet, that's exactly what we see Mark do as he intros the gospel, the very first sentence of the gospel in Mark chapter 1, verse 1, where Mark says, this is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Okay, and with this declaration, with the very first sentence of the gospel, he, he is declaring that, that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the son of the one true God, and therefore telling Nero and everybody around saying that we are, will not worship you. We are only worshiping Jesus. Right? And with that declaration, it gives full authority in their life to God. Right? Which then starts this theme of the entire gospel that we have followed through all of these stories and and everything that we've studied, and obviously we have not had time to study every story and every verse, right, and every parable, but yet we've followed this theme through the gospel of who or what do you give authority to in your life. And again, in this context, we see that Mark was telling them that, that God deserves your worship and your ultimate authority. And yet there are many other things that we can give authority to in our life, whether that would be King Nero or anybody, anything or anybody else, there we can give authority to lots of things. And yet, as a follower of Jesus, as a committed Christian, we are saying that God has the ultimate authority in our life. Right? And with that declaration, as Mark makes it, again, they invited persecution and, and struggle into their life. And yet, God brought them through that, just as he will each of us. Now, this morning, as we are here celebrating Palm Sunday, right, as this is the start of Holy Week, we're going to read today the triumphal entry as described in the Gospel of Mark. And it's found in Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. So if you have your Bible with you today, I invite you to open with me to Mark chapter 11. If you don't have your own Bible or don't have it with you today, there are Bibles provided for you in the seats that you're welcome to use. 
And uh, the, the page numbers are included on the outline of where you can find this passage in those Bibles. But we're going to open up together to Mark chapter 11, starting at verse 1, okay, where it says, As Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the towns of Beth Bethpage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into the village over there, he told them, and as soon as you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, what are you doing? Just say, the Lord needs it and will return it soon. The two disciples left and found the colt standing in the street, tied outside the front door. As they were untying it, some bystanders demanded, what are you doing untying that colt? And they said what Jesus had told them to say, and they were permitted to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it, and he sat on it. Many in the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the field. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God! Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the, the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Praise God in highest heaven. And so Jesus came to Jerusalem and went into the temple. And after looking around carefully at everything, he left because it was late in the afternoon. And then he returned to Bethany with the twelve disciples. So as we pause there and we see again this event of this triumphal entry of Jesus entering the holy city of Jerusalem. Again, Jerusalem is the city that David established as king, as the, 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 the nation's capital. It's where he built the palace he lived in. It's within, again, became the center of of, of everything um, of Israel, and that's also then where Solomon built the temple, okay? and Jerusalem was steeped in history, right? And the entire Jewish faith was centered on this city. Okay? And as Jesus here enters into the city, okay? and there are there are many um, prophecies and, and and traditions and all kinds of things that are that are wrapped into this event, right? Of Jesus being welcomed into the city in this procession, in this parade of sorts. Okay, now first off that we see that, that all the gospel writers focus on is the donkey, right? And, and now this was a very significant prophecy that was given in the Old Testament regarding the Messiah. Now Mark doesn't focus on it as much as some of the other gospel writers do, but notice he does, he talks about it. Okay, in fact, some of the other gospel writers literally quote some of the Isaiah and Old Testament prophecies regarding the donkey. Okay, but this was a very important piece that needed to be done, right, in order to fulfill all the prophecies regarding the coming Messiah. Okay, and now notice this phrase that Mark does include, that the, again, that the, 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 uh, the crowd shouts. One of the things that they were shouting as he comes through this processional was the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Again, this was a, a long-standing tradition that the, the chosen Messiah, right, would come and would be in the line of David. Again, another prophecy that had to be fulfilled in order for the Messiah to, to be the Messiah, according to the scriptures. Okay, and yet, um, again, this was a royal welcome into this holy city. Okay, he, was, he was welcomed in as royalty, being anointed, again, as this Messiah, right, and as this next leader of Israel. Now, many people were expecting to see God's power manifested through Jesus. Okay, they were expecting this Messiah. This was not a surprise. This is something that they were looking forward to. And as they welcomed him into the city, right, they, they expected Jesus. But yet, they expected something completely different from the Messiah than what Jesus was about to fulfill. Okay, their expectations was a military leader. Literally somebody that would, that would rule the way that David ruled, right? And that they were expecting the Messiah to come to overthrow the government, to take Israel back, and to move them back up as a world power. Now, that's what they were expecting. And yet, what came, as we know, at the end of this week was the cross. Right? It was very different than what they expected, but yet it was exactly God's plan for the Messiah. Right, as, as we realize, again, all of these, these different prophecies and all these, these depths of teaching that is happening in this experience, yeah, I just want to show you this, this short video that explains it better than I can explain it. So we're going to watch, again, this video that explains the triumphal entry and 
Palm Sunday a little deeper. deeper. In a small corner of the city, a parade began. No internet, no announcements, no tweets. Word of mouth carried the news. And the parade had no floats, no balloons, no bands. Just the voices of the people singing one word. Hosanna. The word has no actual meaning. It'd be like trying to define the word hooray. But still, they knew what it meant. Hosanna. The king has arrived. Jesus had been working quietly behind the scenes, urging people to not tell of what they saw. But how can you keep a secret like that? They were ready for him. They had been praying for his arrival for generations. The Messiah had come. Hosanna. They waved branches. They threw their coats on the road. It was all they could do. They gave him a breeze and they sang him a song. Hosanna. It was all they had. They would die for him. But what they didn't understand is that it was going to happen the other way around. The Pharisees were watching, waiting, planning. He was too popular. The crowds would follow him anywhere. But even if you silence the crowd, you can't silence creation. Even if you silence the crowd, the rocks would sing, the trees would take up chorus, and the earth itself would sing, Hosanna. Hosanna, the king has arrived. Hosanna, the king has arrived. All right, and with this processional, Jesus goes into the city. Right, and with this, with this public parade, this triumphal entry, it, it publicly declares that Jesus is the Messiah and all of the divine authority that comes with that title. Okay, again, this triumphal entry publicly declares that Jesus is the Messiah. And again, we've been seeing all throughout the gospel, Jesus continues to tell the disciples and the demons and, and all of these things and every miracle and every healing, don't tell people who I really am. And yet here, it is publicly declared. Right? There is no secret anymore. The secret is out. Right? Jesus has been anointed and, has been, and, and welcomed into the city as the Messiah. Right? And with the Messiah comes the divine authority from God. And as we've been watching this theme all the way through the gospel about who or what is your authority, again, Jesus publicly claims the divine authority in this moment. Right? And as we see, um, as he does that, as he enters the city, then we see in verse 11, it says, So then Jesus came to Jerusalem, and he went into the temple. And after looking around carefully at everything, he left because it was late in the afternoon. And then he returned to Bethany with the 12 disciples. Again, this was this, this public entering into Jerusalem, right, as he claims the identity of Messiah, takes the, the divine authority that comes with it, and he goes straight to the temple. Now, th- this, again, starts this holy week, this last week of Jesus' life. Okay, and after this triumphal entry, Jesus spends the next several days in the temple in Jerusalem. Okay, now, and by this point, Jesus didn't go anywhere unnoticed. Right? He makes a huge splash, in fact, anywhere he goes. And even in this time, right, this is the week before Passover. And as I said, Jerusalem is the center of Israel, the center of their religion. And Passover is this, this celebration of the sacrificial lamb. Right, that, that, that saved them on all their firstborn coming out of Egypt. And they, they celebrate this every year, and, and, and they make this pilgrimage into the city. And, and this week, every year, Jerusalem swells with people. 
Hey, and again, he did not show up like at the off season of tourism. I mean, this was the height. Okay, there were people everywhere coming, flooding into the city for Passover. Now, again, the timing of this is not coincidental. Right? This is very purposeful. And when Jesus goes into this, and as Jesus becomes the sacrificial lamb for us on the cross, again, the timing, in fact, is perfect for him to replace that Passover lamb. And yet, as he does this, he goes in to, uh, you know, to the temple, and he spends his entire time of this week there teaching and interacting with the Pharisees and with other people. In fact, in, in Mark's gospel, Jesus does not do any healings or miracles or exorcisms in this last week of his life. He just hangs out in the temple the entire week, right, and teaches and interacts with the people. Because he knows these are the final days of his ministry, right? The disciples have to get it this week. The Pharisees have to get it this week because there is not next week. And obviously Jesus knows that. Right, and obviously, as, we, as we've seen him go all of this, he's also stepping into the home turf of the Pharisees. Right, Jesus is, um, is stepping into the temple. I mean, the temple is where they lived, and it's where they worked. It's where it was the center of the sacrificial law. Right, it was where people would come and make their sacrifices. And again, this was the home turf of the Pharisees and the religious leaders. And now Jesus, again, had interacted with them in the hillside and in all these other towns and villages. And now Jesus was, had arrived at their home. Okay, and with this all said, okay, Jesus is then first act in the temple as he goes out to Bethany each night because, again, the city was overrun with people. There was nowhere to stay there. They stayed with friends in Bethany and walked into the city every day. And so he goes out, they sleep, they come back in the next day. And again, Jesus doesn't start this week quietly. In fact, Jesus' first action in the temple the next morning is to start flipping tables and start kicking people out of the court, right? And Jesus, I mean, does a belly flop into the deep end, right? And creates this huge chaotic mess for the religious leaders. Okay, and as he does that, then he, he moves into this, this final phase of his earthly mission. Okay, and we see, again, this, this interaction with them continue. Okay, and it kind of culminates into this interaction between Jesus and the Pharisees in Mark chapter 11, verse 27. So we're going to continue on the story here, verses 27 through 33. Okay, where it says, again, they entered Jerusalem, and as Jesus was walking through the temple area, the leading priests, the teachers of religious law, and the elders came up to him. And they demanded, by what authority are you doing all these things? Who gave you the right to do them? I'll tell you by what authority I do these things if you answer one question, Jesus replied. Did John's authority to baptize come from heaven, or was it merely human? Answer me. And they talked it over among themselves. If we say it was from heaven, he will ask why we didn't believe John. But do we dare say it was merely human? For they were afraid of what the people would do, because everyone believed that John was a prophet. And so they finally replied, we don't know. And Jesus responded, then I won't tell you by what authority I do these things. Again, we see this interaction between Jesus and these religious leaders. Because Jesus was not there quietly. Right? Jesus um, continued to escalate the tension. Right? And again, this challenge from them right, is not a surprise to us as we've watched this whole theme go through the gospel. Right? They show up and they're by, well, who gives you the right? Who gives you the authority to come in and ruin our temple? Right? And they challenge him very strongly. And yet, in the subsequent exchange that comes after this, right, Jesus pushes it back on them and says, okay, I will, I'll answer your question. Right? But again, it somewhat implies, like, but you're not going to like the answer. Right? And then he says, I will give you the answer, but first, I need you to give me this answer. Right? Please justify your actions, and then I will justify mine. Right? And he turns this on, on to them. And ushers in this cosmic shift of authority. 
Okay, with this interaction, we see this cosmic shift of authority, and it starts, and it's shifting from the law to the covenant of grace. Because that was the mission of the Messiah, was to usher in the new covenant of grace. Right, and we see Jesus as he pokes the hornet's nest over and over and over again in this week. And then now we see this shift is occurring. And the religious leaders can sense it. Right, and they're freaking out about it. Right, because the temple, again, is where God's presence dwells. Right, they, and these temple leaders were, were the bridge between God and the people. Right, and they had to come to them to make their sacrifices, to hold up the law in order to have God's presence in their life. And yet, this authority for, that they owned in the law is now shifting away from them. Right, because Jesus' work is about to culminate on the cross. And with the death on the cross and his subsequent resurrection, he ushers in the new covenant of grace. Which means the law, the days of the law are numbered. It is coming to an end, and they can sense it. Their season of leadership is being taken from them. Again, we see their, their fear, right, and, and their, their, their uncomfortableness with all of this in their response in verse 33, when they responded with, we don't know. Now, this response by them is way more fitting than they even realize because they have no idea what's about to go down. Again, their true reasoning for this answer was fear, right? It tells us that, right? They, were, they, they feared public, public embarrassment for not following John or the fear of the public anger if they claimed that John was a false prophet, right? And again, we see how fear paralyzes them. And so they decide to take door number three and declare, we don't know, right? And yet, Jesus takes the point further. Right? He's, he does not let them get away with the we don't know and just, just move on. Right? In fact, the, in, in the following verses in chapter 12, Jesus goes into a parable that teaches against the religious leaders in chapter 12. And he calls them out for not submitting to God's authority and for protecting their own selfish motives. And he traps them once again in their sin. Yeah, and we see all of this parable culminates in verses 10 and 11 in chapter 12, okay, where Jesus says, he says, didn't you ever read this in the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is wonderful to see. Yeah, and he's telling him, he's like, this whole religious system that is built up around you is about to come crumbling down. Okay, and it is going to be rebuilt on the Messiah. That's the cornerstone. Everything moves from there. Right? And he says, the stone the builders rejected, and he's calling that they are rejecting the Messiah, and he's like, now, as you reject, that fulfills all these other prophecies and sets up the new covenant of grace. Right? And the entire covenant of grace is, is built on the cornerstone of the Messiah. Right? And this is wonderful to see, because he's saying this is the next phase of God's plan to redeem the world. And he says, change is in the air. Right? We are moving from the old covenant to the new covenant, and he's He's inviting them to come with him, and yet they are rejecting the cornerstone. But as we see this interaction and this thing continue to move with them, right, then we see the, the interactions with these Pharisees, more quizzes, more debates, all these things ensue in these following verses. Okay, and then we see in Mark chapter 12, okay, verses 28 through 34, we get a surprising curveball. Okay, so we're going to read this interaction with this religious leader in Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 34. Okay, where it says, One of the teachers of religious law was standing there listening to the debate, and he realized that Jesus had answered well. And so he asked, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? And Jesus replied, The most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord your God is the one and only Lord, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. And the teacher of religious law replied, Well said, teacher. 
You've spoken the truth by saying that there is only one God and no other. And I know it is important to love him with all my heart and all my understanding and all my strength and to love my neighbor as myself. This is more important than to offer all of the burnt offerings and sacrifices required in the law. Realizing how much the man understood, Jesus said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Okay, now I said this is a curveball because suddenly there's a positive interaction between Jesus and a religious leader. Right, as this religious leader, he's standing back, he's watching all this happen, and, and again, he comes and he acknowledges Jesus' authority and the truth that he teaches. Right, and then Jesus comes back, and through this exchange, we end up in this, in this positive exchange between these, these, these two leaders. And then we see this phrase that concludes this passage where it says, and after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Okay, and this, it becomes the conclusion of the controversies between Jesus and the religious leaders in Mark's gospel. There are no more interactions between them. Okay, and with that, we realize and we learn that the acknowledgement of God, his authority, and his plan is extremely powerful. Okay, it is extremely powerful. If we acknowledge God, we acknowledge his authority, and we acknowledge his plan— Right, it has comes with extreme power. Because again, this, this tension has been building forever, and yet with this religious leader, and when he makes that declaration, right, it's all resolved. It is extremely powerful. And the same is true in your life. Right? If you acknowledge God, give him the authority that he deserves, and submit to his plan, it is extremely powerful. Right? And yet, all of that power is released in your own life and in through that, and yet that power will either unify or it will divide. Okay, and we see both of those happen in this situation. Okay, first, first the unity. Okay, between this, reli- this religious leader and Jesus. Okay, first the religious leader acknowledges Jesus' anointing in verse 32 when he says, well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth. Right, he acknowledges Jesus' authority at that moment. And then Jesus acknowledges the religious leader's heart condition in verse 34. Right, when he responds to him, realizing how much the man understood, then Jesus says, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Okay, and we see this, again, positive affirmation between these two leaders, right, as they are now unified through the bigger plan that God has to redeem the world. Right? And through God's power and through his truth, these two leaders are unified. Again, this is a breath of fresh air as Jesus and this religious leader literally live out the two greatest commandments through this conversation. Again, I cannot overspeak how huge this is. Right? Because the gospel of Jesus, the, the mission of the Messiah, right? as they live out, again, the two greatest commandments through this exchange, and it unifies them. Right, as they literally live out the gospel through this conversation. This is huge. Because they both now become each other's neighbor. And they love each other as themselves through this exchange. And yet, it also has the power to divide. Because, that, like I said, this is a turning point in the story. There is no more interactions between Jesus and the religious leaders. Okay, and, and now it turns from public debates to secret plans. And the secret plans of those who did not, do not acknowledge God, his authority, or his plan, those secret plans are now we have to get rid of Jesus. End of story. Right, and their public debates now moves to secret plans. And those plans play out now in the following days that end on the cross. Right? And God's power will either unify or it will divide. And the same is true in our lives today. When we acknowledge God's authority, his plan in our life, and consider to move forward in our faith, it will unify us with some people and it will divide us from others. Okay? And we see this play out here and it plays out in our life every time we 
acknowledge Jesus as our ultimate authority. All right now, with this conversation, many different issues that have been arrived and that we've, we've seen go throughout the gospel are resolved in this one conversation. Right, that there is one God and not many idols. That the condition of our heart is of utmost importance. That God's word is more important than human tradition. That all of the commands point us back to love as our motivation. That it is ultimately God's authority and not man-made authority. All of these things get resolved in this one conversation. And ultimately, it ushers in the fact that change is in the air. Right, the, the, we are transitioning from the original covenant of the law into the next covenant of grace. And as we see this change is, is happening right in front of their eyes, right, is that their reaction to change, again, just like today, is all over the board. Right, for some, they're excited. For some, they hate change and they can't, they can't deal with it. Right, but for lasting and healthy change, it must go back to the core values of your heart. Lasting and healthy change must go back to the core values of your heart. Is change easy? Absolutely not. Change is hard. Right, change always comes with ripples and with some pain. Okay, but typically anything that has long-term rewards is painful in the short term. Okay, and the opposite is also true. Typically, whatever brings short-term comfort and ease yields long-term negative results. Again, we, we choose pain in the short term for positive long-term results, right, or vice versa, right? We choose comfort and ease in the short term, but it yields long-term results. This concept is true financially. This concept is true with our health. This concept is true in relationships. And it is true spiritually. Right? If a short-term sacrifice, and it comes with some pain and some change, will yield long-term results and positive results. Okay, but change always forces you to go back to your foundation. And that's exactly what happens in this interaction. We see in verses 32 and 33, it says, it says there's only one God and no other. And I know it's important to love him with all my heart and understanding and all my strength and to love my neighbor as myself. And this is more important than to offer all the burnt offerings and sacrifices are required in the law. Again, this religious leader acknowledges okay, the, the core values of what it means to be a Christian. Okay, he openly acknowledges, again, it takes him back to the core values of what it means to follow Jesus. Right? And, and th those core values are this. Number one is that there's only one God. Yeah, I'll tell you that this is the thing that sets Christianity apart from every other world religion. Okay, is that there's one God. Christianity is a monotheistic faith. One God. Every other world religion believes in many gods. Okay, first, there's only one God. And then also, again, the next core value of being a Christian is that I have wholehearted devotion to that God. Right? There's only one God, and yet wholehearted devotion. Everything I worship, everything I do is all focused on him. Right? He has supreme authority. Okay, and then the, the third, again, core value, right, of being a Christian that is identified here is that, that I then live a life of love. Right, I love my neighbor as myself, right, and that my motivation for everything that I do is love, right, and that that is the fruit of my life and my daily actions and my attitudes is love as I live out my wholehearted devotion to God. Right, and he, here this religious leader acknowledges these core values of what it means to be a Christian, and with doing that, he acknowledges the change after he does that as he says that this is more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices of the law. But again, he's acknowledging the change that is happening. He's saying, uh, like, these core values of that, if we move into this covenant of grace, is more important than the law and the sacrifices. Again, Holy Week is about a change of season. It's about transitioning from one covenant to the next covenant. It is about seeing the next phase of God's plan to redeem the world happen. Holy Week is a transition time. 
Again, the new covenant of grace does not discount the old law. It fulfills the old law. It is built on top of it. Right? And it's exactly what Jesus means when he says, I'm the cornerstone, and everything else is built on top of it. Right? Holy Week is a transition of God's plan to the next phase of his plan to redeem the world. Again, and it's in spring, right? In spring, it not, it's not a coincidence. Again, it's in spring because spring represents new life, right? A, a, a renewed motivation and a renewed passion, right? That's why we spring clean, right? Because um, it's the light at the end of the tunnel. It's the fresh air at the end of a hard season. And that's what Holy Week represents, is a transition from the old law to the new covenant of grace. Right, and as we walk through the events of Holy Week this week together as a church and, and as our nation and world walks through Holy Week, right, is it represents this change from the old law to the covenant of grace. It's ultimately about change. And which brings me then to my final thought today, and that is this, is when we are faced with change, we have a choice. We can either dig in our heels and fight it, or embrace it and raise to a new level. Okay, what is God leading you to change in your faith journey? What is God leading you to change in your faith journey? What step do you need to take? Maybe that step is receiving Christ as your Savior for the first time. By confessing your sins, asking for forgiveness, inviting him in your life, and say, God, move me in a new direction as you join the journey of faith. Maybe it's just being the fact of acknowledging that maybe you're stalled in your faith and saying, I need a change to continue to move forward. Again, I don't know what change God's leading you to in your faith journey, but I encourage you, whatever it is, to take that step. Lord God, we praise you, God, that nothing is impossible for you. God, that even ushering in a new covenant of grace was not too big of a job for you. And God, we thank you, Lord, that you overcame everything through the cross. God, through your death and through your resurrection, Lord, we can be forgiven, we can be washed clean. And God, that we can embrace the change, Lord, that you have in our life as we journey forward in our faith. God, we praise you that nothing is impossible for you. And God, we pray that you would continue to lead us, especially as we enter this holy week. God, that we would move again forward by leaps and bounds in our own faith. And God, that we would represent you in this world, Lord, that is more open to who you are this week than any other time of the year. And God, I pray that you would, Lord, help us to take your light into this world this week. God, be in those conversations, be in those invitations, Lord, as, as we just hope to see, Lord, people get changed by you, Lord, through this holy week, as we celebrate everything that you accomplished through the cross and through your resurrection. God, guide us as we go this week, Lord, that we can embrace the change in our own life, God, and we can guide others and point them, Lord, to what truly unifies, and that is you and your spirit. God, guide us as we go this week. We praise you, we thank you, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.